Thanks, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Standing room only in here, man. It's like, man, you guys had to have the, the VIP to come in here, huh? Uh, I was at a conference here last week for a software, other software company, and just for scale, right? Like this software conference, it was like two levels. This one has like this back end level. I'm walking upstairs. I'm like, where's this Joshua room at? And they're like, well, you got to go upstairs. You got to go down the stairs. You got to go back again. You got to turn. I'm like, what is this? This is like everywhere. Uh, so really excited to be here. Um, uh, like like Mike mentioned, um, the session we're going to be talking about is the application of AI machine learning in finance. Uh, so let's get started. Okay, so a little bit about me. Born and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana. Where are my Hoosier fans at? Where are the Hoosiers? Hoo hoo! None. I always get at least one person that's a Hoosier fan. Uh, so I'm really excited about the Hoosiers. We just got Coach Mike Woodson back in the realm of basketball. Um, I won't age myself and say when I went to college, but I'm a lot older than what you guys think. But, you know, IU, when I was growing up, it was like right before I was going to school, IU made it to the to the national championship game. They beat Duke. So I know Coach K was in his feelings yesterday, you know, yesterday when I was like, Coach K, dude, sorry about that, man. I know that was on your on your track. That was probably not one you wanted to get. Right. Uh, and IU basketball, like, I'm coming into my freshman year. I'm like, man, we just went to the national championship. This is going to be like the best four years of my life for college basketball. It actually wasn't the best years of my life in college basketball. But at the time, Playboy released that IU was the number one party school in the nation. So it was, uh, it was definitely the best four years. Um, I graduated from IU Kelly School of Business. Uh, tell you guys a good story about that. So I originally started off as a marketing major. Um, so I came in, I really loved like the creative aspect of marketing, um, really loved the four P's. You guys, are, you guys would be like, oh, I love how this guy talks about C's and P's all the time. That's usually what I do a lot of stuff. And I loved it. And then I came into uh, the IU Kelly School of Business and uh, anybody knows this thing called Sarbanes-Oxley? Anybody know what that is? Just a little small thing that happened, right? Like Sarbanes-Oxley happened, Enron got smoked. Uh, R.I.P. Arthur Anderson. Any Arthur Anderson people in here? There's got to at least be a couple Arthur Anderson people in here. No? Yes. Yes. You know what I'm talking about. You rode that wave. Uh, and then, you know, Sarbanes actually happened and all the big four, it was like Oprah Winfrey for jobs. It was like, and you get a job and you get a job. So uh, I jumped on the accounting finance road, um, started my career off at Ernst & Young. Any Ian Wires in here? Yes. Terrell. Yes, two Ian Wires, yes. So started off at Ernst & Young. Um, most of my professional background has always been in high growth, entrepreneurial, startup technology companies. Uh, basically what I come in and do, take you from seed to startup, to scale up, to exit. Um, and basically what that is, is like, hey, grow you up, you're in diapers, you get to be 13, you're a teenager now, you get out of high school, you're a scaling company, you're like 25, 26, you got to start paying bills, you're off your parents' insurance, you get exited out, right? That's basically what I do for businesses. Um, I've been in business a little over 17 years. I know for some of you, some of you in here, you're like, dude, whatever. That's like, you got a lot more years underneath your belt you need to get done. Um, and then this last one is I get really passionate. I've been a public speaker. Uh, I've been on the planning committee for the AICPA FPNA conference uh, for a little over, this is my seventh year on the planning committee. I first came in as an attendee, so like all you guys. Um, but this is when the AICPA just had like a separate FPNA conference and it was a lot smaller. This one's huge. I think it's like 3,000 attendees, 200 sessions, 150 speakers. It's absolutely crazy. Um, and then another unique fact about myself, I am an amateur boxer. So funny story about that. I used to fight competitively amateur boxing uh, for four years. Uh, my record is 38 and four. And I know you're going to ask me, you're going to ask me this, Chris, have you ever been knocked out? No, I've never been knocked out before, but I have been stunned. Uh, and of my wins, I had eight knockouts. Um, but I'll tell you the best story that I've had. And this is like ties into business. So I'm in the Golden Gloves of the semifinals in Indianapolis, Indiana. For everybody who doesn't know, anybody knows what the Golden Gloves is? Man, you're my dude, man. You were with me. You were with me today. Um, the Golden Gloves is the largest amateur boxing tournament in the United States. So every state has a Golden Gloves, um, and I was in the semifinals. So if I win this, I go to the finals. 
if I win that weight class at 141, I go fight in the Nationals and I represent Indiana. So I'm coming out first three seconds of the, uh, of the semifinals. And mind you, I've got my family there. I've got my coworkers. I've got like a cheering squad. I'm not even joking. I got a cheering squad of people that are at this Golden Gloves, right? I come out. I'm with the guy. I throw a lazy little jab. He slips under the jab. I was like, this is bad. This is going to not end well. Muscle memory didn't kick in that fast because I threw this lazy jab. He instantly slipped under it. Body shot. This right here, this section right here, guys, that's where your liver is. If you ever take a body shot in your liver, it's basically your body installing updates on your computer. You know where your computer just updates and it just doesn't even tell you, it just like restarts. So I'm sitting there and I'm just like, oh my goodness, my whole left side, numb. I'm talking about I had nothing, right? I ended up getting through the fight. I didn't win. I lost in the scorecards. But this is the lesson. There'll be nothing in business, accounting, finance, FP&A, or CFO work that I'll do that'll ever be more challenging than taking a body shot and not pooping myself in front of everybody. So that is a win. And I'm like, hey, man, this accounting, finance stuff, like, this is fine. I, I took a body shot in the golden gloves. I didn't poop myself. So it's cool. All right, so what we're going to talk about today, um, these are the four learning objectives. So when you guys get your reviews and the AICPA sends you, if I did a great job, I'm going to deliver all four of these. That's it. I'm going to deliver all four of them. There is no thing, oh, three out of the four. No, deliver all four. The first one is um, we'll talk about some AI machine learning solutions. Um, I think like artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, is a definitely a, a lagging uh, theme for accounting, finance, and FP&A. The second thing we'll talk about is how does AI machine learning impact your people, process, platform, partnership, literally like my organization. Uh, we get on the P's now. I call them the six P's of financial transformation. How does that impact your people? How does that impact your processes? How does that impact your partnerships? To me, in any business, and I've seen a lot of high growth businesses, I've seen some of them. One company I was at, $150 million of VC money. Uh, four years later, I get the email, and that company's completely gone after $150 million. I've seen some SaaS businesses that take you all the way to SAP, and we get that nice six, uh, we get that nice seven X multiple, and sell to SAP for half a billion dollars. So I've seen it across the board, um, and I think these uh, these principles are really important. The third one is um, your readiness. I think AI, machine learning, like there's certain industries, there's certain data sets, there's certain professions, there's certain functional areas that are really, really poised to leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we'll talk about that. Um, and then the last one, we'll actually look at some real life use cases. And these are use cases that I've actually worked with the organization, the data that I quoted in there, the CFOs that I've talked with, the CEOs, the companies that I've worked with are literally applications of artificial intelligence or RPA inside of functional roles inside of your organizations. Uh, so those are going to be the learning objectives, um, and those are the things I'll keep anchoring back to. So let's jump right in. What is AI and machine learning? I won't read all of this, but the best way to describe AI and machine learning is that machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. So for example, artificial intelligence is the Kelly School of Business. That's where I went to business school. That is AI. Kelly School of Business equals AI. Machine learning is marketing in the Kelly School of Business. RPA is finance in the Kelly School of Business. Internet of Things is uh, operations. Um, natural language processing is uh, strategic planning in the Kelly School of Business. So I think a common misconception that a lot of people get is that AI and machine learning are the same. They're not, right? So. I think another really important point that I get asked a lot of times, all the time, is AI and machine learning going to take my job? It's a common question I always get asked, right? To me, my, my point is always going to be AI and machine learning, the goal of it is never to take the place of decision making inside of an organization. What it is meant to do is put the finite resources that we have in the right position to make that business decision. So there's a framework that I like to call the decision cycle. Processes draw data. Data is then turned into information. 
Information is shared through knowledge to ultimately make a business decision, right? That is a decision cycle, at least from my knowledge when I was, uh, when I was doing walkthroughs and tests of the controls at Eli Lilly um, in the audit practice, and I got to see Eli Lilly is like workflows and controls and processes. And, and I remember my audit partner, uh, he said, Chris, this is the skeletal framework of a business. This is the skeletal framework of a billion dollar business. This is the skeletal framework of the biggest business in Indianapolis and you're learning it. And I was just like, I felt like I was Oz behind the scene, right? I'm like, I'm seeing the processes, right? But that framework, right? You got your people. Listen, here's a golden nugget. If you've got your people right now churning and burning through Excel, or you just sent that email to your, you know, your finance manager, your VP saying, hey, run the, run the Excel document, they're already uh, probably you know, two feet, two feet out the door, right? And you only have two feet, so they're already out the door, right? You don't want to put people in that position. Don't have people in these low value, routine, very manual, super complex, Excel-driven processes. You don't want people to do that, right? So for me, AI and machine learning in that decision cycle process, that should accelerate you from process to information. Let the tools and technologies do that. There's a company that I do work with called Planful, and they just introduced a AI machine learning tool around, it's called Projections. And it's basically what it does. It provides you the gold standard in budgeting and forecasting. What is that gold standard? Well, you got your people, you got your pro, you got all this tribal knowledge, you got this 10 years experience, you got these great partnerships, you've got this great value proposition that you built, and you go produce that 12 month rolling forecast. You got that one element, that A lane. Now you've got a tool and technology that's creating this B path for you. That's, that's looking at the data. It's looking at the changes that have happened. It's looking at the historical information. You've got A, B testing in budgeting and forecasting. That is the gold standard, right? And again, it's not, it's not replacing that VP of FPNA. It's not replacing your tribal knowledge and all the experience you have. It's supplementing it. And as you go through another day, as you go through another month, that algorithm and your people are getting better. That variance is getting tighter. That's really what the goal of AI and machine learning is, right? And I think the, the other people side of AI and machine learning is upskilling. What is upskilling? Upskilling is uh, one of the things that, you know, when the pandemic happened, oh, yeah, I'm talking about the P word. Um, when the pandemic happened, right? There were people that looked at this and was like, yo, this is, this is, uh, the business looked at, the business looked at the office of the CFO, right? I know I was at a business, I was at an international marketing platform company that had about a thousand employees all across the globe, about a hundred million dollars of ARR. We were in 25 different countries. And when that moment happened, the CMOs, the CROs, the chief sales officers, the chief commercial officers, all those other officer roles that are in sales, right? They were like, yo, uh, I don't know what's going on. I don't, I don't know how to do this, right? And us CFOs, we were like, yo, we got this. Like, we'll manage the risk. We'll manage everything. We'll navigate through this, right? And I tie that back. That was the biggest opportunity that has happened in accounting, finance, FP&A, and CFOs in probably the last 30 years. Why? Because we stepped up. The business needed us not to be the scorekeepers, right? Some maybe some people were scorekeepers, right? Some people were like, yeah, we're keeping score. But we showed the business that we can navigate uncertainty, we can manage complexity, we can communicate clear, concise conclusions that the business can understand. We were great storytellers, we leveraged technology, we set an entire new baseline. The baseline is different now. It's completely changed. What the business needed from us 10 years ago is not what the business is going to need from us two years from now. The business said, CFOs can do this now. Like, we have the bar here as scorekeepers. We know CFOs can be a whole lot more than this. We know accounting finance can be way more value proposition, right? They don't have to be the ASC, ASC, ASC 852 lease experts, right? which I'm not knocking all that. You need, you need that piece of it. I'm not knocking the compliance side of it. But I'm saying like, 
let's be for real, right? If you wanted, did you want me to be like the best A A A S C eighty five twenty or A C six oh six compliant person, or do you want me to be a great storyteller in the business? Do you want me to know how to build great partnerships? Do you want me leveraging AI and machine learning inside the organization? So our finite resources are put in the most valuable activities inside of the organization. Do you want us to be great communicators? Do you want us to build a community inside the organization? Do you want us to have the clarity to draw conclusions? That's what the business needs. And to me, like tying this back, that's the scalability of the people and the processes that I just talked about on this slide here, right? Scale is there. AI machine learning is meant to scale you, not eliminate you. Now, another piece of it, I get some people, right? And we're gonna go into some use cases and, and literally talk about this. If you're a person and you're like, hey, Chris, my staff account or my AP person, she loves coding that rent expense for the last 30 years because we're not moving out of our building. You're hitting that subcode 6,000 and account 6502. She loves doing that every day. Well, that's not value add. There's a tools and technologies that do that a lot faster and a way more efficient than a human person doing that. But that's back to that upskill. Okay, so what are some short-term goals, right? Short and, and this is that Kelly School of Business that I talked about, right? Do I have the laser thing on here? Yeah, laser pointer. Meow. So uh, the artificial intelligence, Kelly School of Business, that's all the different branches that is, is with it, right? And again, you see machine learning in there is a subset of AI. Right. So if you leave here today, one takeaway is like, hey, machine learning is part of AI. It is not AI. Right. Um, natural language processing. That's Siri. OK, Google. Oh, God damn it. I can't do that. My phone's going to go. Sorry if anybody's phone or Siri goes off. That's what natural language processing is. Tell you guys a story about that. I worked at a company called Cha Cha Search. Nobody probably here is going to know that company. But Cha Cha Search. Oh, may maybe one person did. I seen a smile over there. Uh, Cha Cha Search, this was back in uh, 2000 and uh, after the housing, uh, the housing market went crazy. 2009, 2008, right? I was working at a company and basically this is before the prevalence of uh, internet on your phone, right? Who, who remembers when the internet on your phone was hyperlinks and it was disgusting? And you thought you were super cool, you were paying $30 a month on Sprint just to get football scores. Oh, was that just me? I, I, yeah, you did it too. Yeah, it was cool, right? Because you're like, hey, what's the score of the game? Like, let me just pop over my phone real quick and I can go to my browser and I can tell the score. I paid $30 a month to do that. Well, I didn't pay $30 a month. I got help to do it. But the company, we were back in 2009 doing language, natural language processing. Basically, the whole value proposition of the company was you would text 242. 242, which remember on the phone, you had to, it had all the numbers on it that spelled cha-cha. You would ask a question. Or you can call 1-800-2-CHA-CHA and say, hey, one of the most questions we got at that time was, what was Michael Jordan's birthday? Right? People would call it. People would text it. And tying that into business, that was a wild, wild west ride. We were burning on a weekly basis probably close to a million dollars a week burning. Cash burn, so that's like money out the door, right? None of that, oh, you take your take your net income and take away depreciation. No, I'm talking dollars for dollars, real money. Burn a million dollars a month, because burn a million dollars a week because we had all these people answering questions. Answering questions on texts, answering questions on calls. And I'm looking at, I'm in a, I'm in a, I was in a quasi accounting role and this is where I started loving FP&A because I was like, man, we're spending so much money why are we spending so much money on Michael Jordan's birthday is not going to change, right? Michael Jordan, you know, his birthday is his birthday. It ain't like tomorrow Michael Jordan has a different birthday. By the way, Michael Jordan is the best player of all time. There's no debate. We can talk about it afterwards. Best player of all time. Just had to throw that in there, right? But his birthday stayed the same. And I asked our CEO, I said, Scott Jones. Mind you, Scott Jones invented voicemail. You can look him up. Awesome dude. Dude's caked out because every time a voicemail is created, he gets bread. But I said, Scott, man, like, why are we doing this? Michael Jordan's birthday is the same. Why are we paying people to give the same question? So we went down on a project leveraging natural language processing to look at all the different answers of all of our questions that we were getting consistent and all the same answers that we were getting. At the time, our automation of questions was like 20%. 
right? The other 80% were paying people. And depending upon the complexity of questions, like if you said, what's the chemical reaction of hydrogen and nuclear, blah, 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 like you got paid more to answer that question versus like Michael Jordan's birthday because it was so reused, right? So we leveraged NLP, and this, mind you, 2008, 2009, we leveraged natural language processing to look and build an algorithm to repurpose the highest ranked answer to common questions that you get. The result was that took our automation from 20% to 70%. In, in three months, we did that. Cash burn went from a million to about $475,552, if I remember correctly. That's what the burn went through. In a week, we were using natural language processing. And when I say we were using this, this was me, controller, some crazy Tableau people, and some software developers. And we reduced spin that way. And this, is the, this was the accounting function asking the question of being curious of like, why is this like that? The best question you can ever ask is why? Why is this like this? And oh, by the way, all you leaders out there, right? If you're, if you're hiring somebody, hire them to be curious. Competency will come, right? You can teach ASC 606. Maybe you can. Some people can, right? But curiosity, can't go buy that at the store, right? And another example, uh, I mean, you could just go down the list of these things. And the application of it, where, where we're going to win really big and where no one's really cracked it is this prescriptive and predictive, this deep learning up here. Prescriptive analytics in accounting finance FP&A is like, that is the territory that hasn't been cracked yet. Nobody really, like, okay, if a software company is in your inbox, they're dropping in your DMs, right, on LinkedIn, and they're saying, look at our prescriptive tool that we utilize. Tell them, well, I call, I call BS on that. Let me see how you do prescriptive, right? Basically, what prescriptive analytics is, is saying, hey, uh, these, all these people in the room, they're in different industries. If they're in manufacturing, based on our close rates, if we convert them in a sales cycle, We'll be able to project, you know, 25% close rate on 10 people. We get, you know, 2.5 deals. Our average deal size is $7,000. Our customer lifetime value is five years. Here's how much enterprise value we can get directly from this conference. Oh, here's how much it costs. Here's the net impact that that's going to have inside the organization. It is, per it is prescriptive. It's taking in data to say, here's what that could be. Again, getting to that gold standard, that baseline. That, the top section of machine learning and deep learning, this is where accounting finance FP&A is going to win big. But the biggest thing that we have going against us, and it's okay, right? It's fine. We are like laggers in technology adoption. Is that fair to say? Some people are just like, you know, you're still using, who has Excel as your FP&A tool? It's fine. I've, I've had it a couple times as, as my FP&A tool, right? Technology adoption is where, and being more, not laggers, not, I'm not even saying early adopters, right? Because we still have the risk, we still have the compliance element, we still have the fiduciary responsibilities of being smart. So I'm not saying be like the marketing people, right? That just go buy a software and just say, hey, this will work, and we'll spend $60,000, and like you try to measure ROI. If you ever try to measure ROI from a marketing person, don't you just feel even more confused after you talk to them, right? It's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? Like, look, ROI is you spent 60. How much did you get back? Well, Chris, it depends on our attribution model. Oh, okay, fine. Like, I'm done. But that piece of it, we have to be at that technology adoption phase, right? Like, we have to be not the laggers, the late people to the game, right, to the party. We have to be more in tune with that. These are a lot of different areas. I, and I've worked and I've consulted and I've worked inside businesses where, like, literally, so many people are doing this stuff. Um, image recognition, right? That is automation around scanning invoices, right? So getting back to the AP person, and I'm, real, I'm, I'm so excited to get these use cases. If we have any AP, AR, collections people in here, I'm sorry in advance. Okay, so we talked about the people, talked about the process. Um, I wanna hit on the, another P of the performance aspect of how would it act, uh, affect performance? So performance of our teams, I consider high performance like one of the most like important aspects that you should be answering as a leader, individual contributor inside your organization. It's just one question. 
What does high performance and partnership mean to my accounting finance FP&A team? If you want to know the answer to that right now, go ask your CEO, go ask your CFO, go ask your board of directors, and just look at them and say, hey, what's my value proposition that I bring to you as a CFO? If that person says to you, hey, man, Chris, you do a really great job of getting me the numbers. You're always good at getting the numbers. I can email you right now as you're presenting, and I can get the numbers. It's fine. That's good, right? That's a scorekeeper. What you want that CEO, that CFO, that board of directors, your VC, your private equity, your growth equity, your strategic equity, whoever equity you have in the business, you want them to say this. There's not a business decision that I make that I don't go consult and advise my finance partner. Why is that important? Because scorekeeping is traditional, it's traditional FP&A. Traditional FP&A is financial planning and analysis, right, Terrell? That's the same, right? That's the traditional definition of it, right? Financial planning and analysis sounds like sounds very sounds very data heavy, right? Tools and technologies can do that a lot better. The answer to that question, 2.0 of FP&A, financial partnership and advising. That's the new baseline. That's what the business wants. That's what I hate. When, I, when I'm in or, inside of organizations and I do consulting with them, uh, one thing I always do is like I like to create the, the atmosphere of being a partner and advisor. I like to do that. I love that advising aspect of it. Some of you may be like, Chris, that's probably good for you because you're super extroverted, but I'm over in the corner and I don't like people. Well, that's going to be a tough ask for you when you want to be a, 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 you know, a partner and advisor. But that's what the business is expecting. And that performance aspect of it. At the end of the day, um, everything that we do is driving a performance aspect inside the business. And it's all about how you go about building that performance relationship inside the business. Business partnership, I, I, honestly, I think in just my life experience, um, a lot of failures on the personal side. But I think in any relationship building, there's two core competencies that you have and building a great partnership, relationship, or anything. It's trust and it's competency. Two things. Where do you think accounting, finance, fp and people, when they go about building the business relationship with that VP of sales, with that marketing person, where do you think they go? They go to the competency piece. They go to saying to that VP of sales, hey, sales, well, I looked at your P&L, and based on your budget to actual performance quarter of the date, you're 30% over your spend in these four areas. I'm going to need an explanation in my Excel document that I've just shared with you of what are driving these variances and what, could I, what should I expect. You know what the business takes away from that? The business here is meow, 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 uh, counting again, right? Don't focus that business partnership on the competency. Build the trust. When I started at a pharmaceutical drug development company, I'll tell you a story about this. I started a pharmaceutical drug development company, publicly traded at the time. Our central labs was Indianapolis, Geneva, Shanghai, Singapore, and Tokyo. We are about $750 million of revenue of the, just the central labs location. Um, we had a very small FP&A team that was leading that entire globe. And we had a very, very tough business partner. Her name was Karen Heyer. She was the VP of sales at Covance, and typically our FP&A team was functioning that you got to sign a certain group. And me, my manager, Deborah Glick, she was like, Chris is different. We're going to sign him to the Global Commercial Organization, which was sales, marketing, client operations, client success. It was, it was the salespeople, which, oh, by the way, don't share this with anybody, but I'm just a salesperson in the finance job. That's really me. So she assigns me to Karen. Karen had a reputation. Some of the other FP&A people that got assigned Karen did, didn't work out. They had post-traumatic stress from working with Karen. Because Karen was, Karen was like, no. My first meeting with Karen, where all everybody else failed, I said, you know what? And I was talking with them, and they're giving me pointers. And they're like, man, Karen's not going to get back to you on your reports. You're going to be late for your variance analysis. She's not really helpful in the forecast. Like, her team's not going to be supportive. Like, Chris, you're in, you're, you're in for it. 
Like, this is going to be tough. And, of course, I looked at it was like, mm, I hear that, but, like, I haven't done it yet. My first meeting with Karen, first conversation, I said, Karen, what keeps you up at night? What challenges and opportunities do you see inside the business right now? How can I help and support you? The look on her face was like, what? Who? What are you, what are you talking about? I, I, Karen, I, I, just, I just want to get, I, I want to get to know you. I want to get to know the business. I want to get to know the, 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 the challenges. I want to get to know the opportunities. I want to know how I can help and serve you. The first four sessions I had with her, never even talked about a number. We didn't even talk about a number. Karen goes back to my manager, Deborah, and is like, hey, Deborah, I don't know. Is, is, he, is Chris on your team? Like, we haven't talked about where I'm at on spin. We haven't talked about pipeline. We haven't talked about amendment deals. We haven't talked about any of this stuff yet. Like, it, it, are you sure? Like, why that's important? Because I focused on building the trust with Karen. And after that, Karen, to this day, is a great mentor of mine. Karen, me and Karen has had some conversations where it feels like therapy. And I'm like, Karen, appreciate that you, I don't know how to help your kids while they're being bad at school right now. Like, we can talk about it, but I don't know how to do that. And I'll listen to you. But how do we talk about how do we tackle these amendments for this Novartis deal that we want to do? And how do we leverage team to do that? I share that as an example because when you talk about business partnership, the competency side and the business is going to expect you to go right into that element. Change that facet. Focus on building the trust. Because at the end of the day, that trust, there's been how many, like, just by show of hands of people, you've had people that you've been in trenches. You've been in wars with some business partners, right? You had to navigate. I remember the biggest thing I had to navigate was the PPP. Who? The PPP. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I brought up a sore spot in that one, right? That was probably one of the biggest, like, it, it wasn't just a finance thing, right? That, to me, was probably one of the most challenging situations professionally, personally, all the P's that I've ever navigated before. But at the end of the day, the performance that that drove kept people in positions. And if I, like, if I got an interview question, somebody interviewed me right now, Chris, tell, what's, what's your biggest highlight? What's the biggest win that you had? Tell me about it. It's the PPP process. Because at the end of the day, that performance drove about keeping our workforce and keeping our principles of making sure we kept people employed, making sure we kept, uh, we, we took care of our people and our customers. That is what performance can do. Um, here's some current, current technologies. Uh, I won't go through all the list of them, but Microsoft is doing some really cool stuff. Of course, Microsoft is always doing cool stuff. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm a Microsoft fanboy, but quietly I am. But Microsoft, um, who's familiar with their Cortana? It's basically like their Siri version. <laughs> My guy in the back. Uh, Cortana is Microsoft's natural language processing that they have, right? By show of hands, how many people are familiar with Power BI? You should be if you use Excel. Yes, it should be like everybody. Okay, good. Power BI. What Microsoft is doing with Cortana and Power BI is about the, it's, it's, it's about the, it, it, I'm telling you, it gives me a little anxiety. And it takes a lot to give me an anxiety. I, one thing I've learned from boxing is I've, pretty much master my fight or fight response. It's because, you know, you have to find being comfort and chaos when you're getting punched. But what Microsoft is doing is they're leveraging Cortana inside of Power BI. Cortana, last six months of sales for our APAC location. On your phone, visually there, right there. I don't know about you, but I like getting those emails. Right, you get the emails. It's like, hey, Chris, what's what's uh what's the uh, last six months of sales in APAC? And you're like, give me a second. I mean, it's gonna take some time to get back to that. I mean, I'm doing something right now. I'm presenting. I get back to you in 20 minutes. Kind of felt, you know, you felt, you know, you had a little. I don't like people asking questions and getting on their phones, right? But that's what they're doing. They've looked at it and said, we got Cortana that really nobody uses, right? But we've got Power BI, which is a Gardner leading business intelligence and data analysis platform that leverages it naturally. You can go in Power BI, you structure your data, you type sentences, and it, it gives you. Yeah, you, you've seen it. Now they're taking it where you can ask questions about it. That is data on demand. 
It gives me anxiety because, but at the same time, I love my business partners. Like if you're able to set that up where you sat down, right? I set up a Power BI instance for uh, the marketing software company I was at, uh, the international one. Our CEO was, was based, he came from Austria in Vienna, which was our headquarters. He moves to Indianapolis, Indiana. I come into his office the first day, right? And I'm meeting him, his name is Ohai. You know, I've talked to him a lot. I've gone to Vienna. I've been to Vienna more times than I've been to any other like US. I was like, Vienna was like my Chicago. And he's here and I'm in his office and I'm looking at his Excel screen. He, uh, looking at his screen, he's got all these Excel just like all over the place. He's like, I gotta go to this Excel sheet to look at marketing. I gotta go to this Excel sheet to look at sales. I gotta go to finance to look at all this. I gotta look at, I gotta go to all these different places to look at one, like to know the business. The thing I said to him, and this is like Inception. Anybody seen the movie Inception where he plants a like seed in his brain and the ghost? I did that. So I said, oh, hi, man, it's, it's really hard to drive the car that's a Marsis. He's like, yeah, Chris, it is. It really is hard. And basically what, we, what, what I was able to do and partner inside the business because I built those relationships, we leveraged Microsoft Power BI to distill our business down to seven key KPIs. Leads drive the opportunities, opportunities to close one, close one to, to new business deals, new business deals are projects completed, projects completed to revenue, revenue to revenue retention rate, sales, marketing, operations, client success, finance, post cycle. We manage the entire customer journey inside of Microsoft Power BI. But it took it a step further. I got all the leaders in the room because if you're going to leverage technology, it's a good job of introducing it. It's a good job of implementing it, but if you want to get that five-star review, you got to ingrain that in the culture. People miss that third eye. You got that email, right? Well, we just implement this new software. You got the email and it's implemented and then you six months fast forward from now and you're like, hey, didn't we implement a new software? And you're like, yeah, let me go search my email for it. You didn't integrate it. And I, that was important to me. So I set all the leaders down in the room. I pulled out their phones. I said, hey, look, I'm going to install it on your phones. This is how you use it. And I popped it up on the screen and it measures those seven different things as fuel gauges. So like a fuel gauge, we can see what our budget was at. We can see where actuals were. We can see what the forecast was, all of that information. And oh, by the way, I said, oh, hi, we need to have this in all, uh, our, all, all of our all hands meeting, which the whole company gets together. This needs to be the first thing we talk about. We need to have this in TVs in the office. People need to know this. And I said, oh, hi, you know, like, that's on your phone. I was like, it's a lot easier to drive this car now that's a Marsis. Set up the fuel gauge aspect of it. And the look on his face as a CEO, he was like, he knew, I, he, knew, he knew what I did to him. But that's an example of the power. And when I talk about team size, guys, like that team size, I had a team. It was three of us. It wasn't like I had a whole, like, six people doing all this stuff. No, it was three of us. And only I was the one that knew the most about Power BI. It's three of us doing that entire proposition. That is the value um, of leveraging these tools to be able to do that. Um, so let's get into the tactical solutions. Um, the first one that I'm going to go through is called Collect AI. So for those collections people, this is a full AI machine learning tool that automates the collections process. Um, Collect AI is a company based in Germany. Um, I've worked extensively with them. They're actually uh, uh, really, really big in uh, Berlin, Germany. Uh, their CEO is a really cool dude. He he uh, he thinks I looks like Lewis Hamilton. No, guys, I don't look like Lewis Hamilton. I get it all the time when I go to Europe. Uh, first thing he said to me when I was on the call with him, he's like, "You look like you Lewis Hamilton." I was like, "I'm sorry, I'm not. This little brother." But basically, what Collect AI does, and for some uh, organization at Amarsis that we were at, our CFO, so. We were structured, we had a team of three. Our EMEA operations had a team of probably eight people in the county finance fp &A, and our APAC had a team of probably about uh, six people. So we were the smallest team inside of the entire Amarsis uh, organization. We were the smallest. And when it came to, uh, I came into the organization as the first county finance fp &A hired, literally building everything from scratch, again, going from seed to startup, I came in, a little bit after seed going right into startup. 
And it got to that time where the CFO was like, hey, Chris, we got to we got to follow the same framework. Like we got to hire you an AP person. We got to hire you a collections person. We got to hire you a staff account. We got to hire you a controller. We got to hire. We got to set the same framework that we did in, in uh, Europe, Middle East and Austria. That's in Maya. I know uh, uh, Steve Player corrected me and says, Chris, when you say Maya, I think of the A as Africa, not as Austria. And I said, Steve, I think of it as Austria because we were an Austrian based company. So. That's what I consider Emea. And he's like, we got to have the same framework as Emea, right? Itamar, Itamar Rosanovic, really great dude. Um, and I said, hey, man, no, I disagree. Itamar was Israeli. If you ever worked with an Israeli in person, they're the best people to work with because you can fight, you can debate, you can be real as possible, and you get it, you get it done. Best, best idea wins. And he was like, tell me why. I said, Itamar, I don't, I don't need all these people. Itamar, we have to stop throwing people to solve basic business problems. Like, stop, stop doing that. I said, look, I don't need all those people. Let me get the same money, though, right? Because I'm not, I'm not giving up the dough. Let me get the same money, but let me invest in tools and technologies. Collect AI is something that we implemented. And basically, uh, basically um, what it did, and this is the Acer example, um, basically what we did is, like, we created collections that was like when people, we had collections is a very cadence driven process, right? Like when they're 15 days from their due date, you send an email reminder, you maybe follow up with a call. If they're 10, if they're 10 to 15 days post, you follow another email, you escalate. It's a very linear manual, like rinse and repeat process, which is a process that's leveraged and poised for AI machine learning. And we implemented that. And basically, when people were communicating with us, they were not communicating with us. They were, creating, they were communicating with our AI tool that we named Herman. We literally had a Herman at Amarsis.com. And Herman was communicating with the people. And they'll follow up and be like, hey, like, well, well you know, uh, we haven't got the invoice. And it would look at that and say invoice hasn't been received. And it would, it would look at the database of invoices that we loaded for all the customers. Herman would send the invoice to the customer. Herman would communicate with them. And our vendors and our customers never even knew that. They, they, they was like, Herman's a really nice person. I'm like, I hope so. And then it even had a setting. I'm not making this up. It had a setting where you could increase aggression levels. We had Herman at like four. But some of our customers like, Herman, bro, like I had to have a conversation, had a one-on-one -on -one with Herman in the room. And I said, Herman, bro, like, we got to do something about the South American customers, man. And he's like, Chris, aggression seven? I was like, nah, man, it's got to be eight. He was like, got you, bro. Right? But we use that. Mind you, that would have been a head count, right? That would have been that person who we had a variable comp set up for him, fully loaded would have cost us, I don't know, probably close to $100,000. We'd had to train them. And we implemented that in our America's location, which was Canada, North America, South America. All the other teams that had those dedicated people, the CFO was like, Chris, uh, how can we get this across the globe? And I said, Itamar, what, what are we going to do about uh, the dedicated controller Elizabeth in the UK? What are we going to do about Steven in Hong Kong? What are we going to do about Larissa in Mexico? He says... Well, Chris, uh, you know, like if we, you made it successful in Americas, we got to make the same thing. I said, Itamar, I disagree with you. He's like, all right, let's have a healthy discussion. I said, there's things about what they do that they could be leveraged in other areas of the organization. This is that upskilling aspect. Tying back to what I talked about, it's not meant to take people's jobs. It's meant to give you upskill, Right. So when we did that, Larissa in Mexico, really great working with her. I said, Larissa, what do you love about what you do? She says, Chris, I love that I get to run a similar process. I love that I get to talk to new customers every day. I love that it's driving a result to the business, cash in the door. I love that I get to work with legal and different other elements of the business. I took a step and said, I want to understand why you like doing this manual, routine, low value process, right? Larissa transitioned to a client success role, which is basically doing the same thing, 
but driving upsells and cross sales uh, for non for the non SaaS people, sell upsells and cross sales are like somebody pays you a thousand and now they pay you twelve hundred. That's an upsell, right? If they pay you a thousand for your technology and they buy the AI technology of it for fifteen hundred, that's a cross sale. Different language. Um, Larissa crushed that role. Crushed it. We repurposed everybody that was in collection role, we repurposed them in other client success roles in the organization. They got out of the finance organization, and I created little minions inside of the commercial organization. We just leveraged that. But my, my CFO was like, most CFOs, when they look at AI machine learning, right, they're like, ROI. In and out. Replacement. I fundamentally disagree with that. Because at the end of the day, I'm not just a financial officer, right? We need to be chief filling officers as well. The people empathetic side of me just could not, I was not going to do that. It's not going to do to these talented people when we have elements inside the organization that they can be repurposed, driving the same value, even though it's not inside the finance organization. The next one is, so that's on the collection side. Here is uh, travel and expenses. Um, this goes until 12.30, right? Okay, cool. Um, travel and expenses. So you may have that T&E person, right? Please, I'm not going to ask the question. I just If you're doing T&E by paper and people are still sending in receipts, that train has sailed 10 years ago. Stop doing that, right? Coupa was a tool uh, that automates that T&E process. The cool thing about them, right, and salespeople, uh, back when traveling wasn't happening, salespeople were, you know, they, I don't know what they were doing with their sales, but now stuff is back open and people were, Coupa were able to geolocate, scan receipts, it automates the entire T&E process. And it collects the data for finance to be able to look at that data and say, yep, I checked it over, it looks good. They go to Starbucks. Um, Starbucks is, if you go to any Starbucks in the world, it's going to be the same Starbucks, what they're going to sell, right? You may buy a coffee or food, but that's probably going to meals and expenses on your P&L, right? And it's depending on the person that scanned that receipt on their phone, if you have them in the right department location, that goes to Chris Ortega, who's in sales. He went to Starbucks. I scanned the receipt. Get that image visualization, right? I scanned it. It's Chris. Here's the department. Here's the code. Here's what it was called. About. Everything scanned in there. Supporting documents all in there. Everything is supported, right? The T and E person that's sitting there collecting the receipts and having to follow up, it's no longer needed anymore. Coupa delivers that solution. Here's the use case that they use it for Coors Light. Um, the biggest element, um, and I talked to the CFO there, uh, 10 million in headcount savings. This is one with Diana. I was like, Diana, she's like, Chris, I gotta. This is a big project. I gotta, you know. I gotta give the wolves, I gotta, I gotta give the wolves some meat. They took it and said, now Coors, Coors at the time, they have a distribution kind of thing. So they got people traveling all across the, the United States, going to all the distributors, selling their beers and selling all that. So they had a significant amount of people and resources dedicated to just managing T and E for just certain divisions inside of Coors. And she implemented Coupa. $10 million of drop through savings that they had. And they implemented that in nine months. Nine months they had this up and running. And that was just for one element of it. And they ended up rolling this globally. I think they actually took a stake in Coupa. They were like, this is game changer for us. And then all the other businesses, like all the other brewing businesses looked at it and was like, this is our chance too. So this was an example of adoption that had a people impact. And I remember talking to her about that. And she was like, Chris, you know, we got, we got the street. We're low in our revenue projections. We got to help that even margin. We got to meet that. Another example, the dedicated AP person that you have on your team. Sweet AP, the entire AP workflow. Even if you want to go a little bit baser, basic than this, bills.com has automation workflows even inside of it that are cool too. But this is an entire framework. From bill being received, to being processed, to being recognized, to sending it to an email, to scanning it for itself, to GL upload, to cash management, to giving you a cash projection, cash flow to say, here's what, here's what I suggest that you spend money on. Here's the most important vendors. Entire AP workflow automated. 
inside of a tool, inside of a technology, right? And I know organizations, I, I, when we got acquired by SAP, I'm not knocking SAP around it, but like the army of people that they have is, re I mean, I'll be on a call, right? Be on a call with SAP and I'm talking about uh, sales and use tax, cause SaaS, that's big, right? I'm on a team with me and my staff accountant, and we used Avalara to manage sales and use tax, right? SAP had 32 people on the call, 32 of them. I'm sitting here popping up. I'm like, I'm at the wrong meeting. Like, this is way too many people. Like, we're in 25 states. Like, we have different filing. Like, we got it down. Like, we automated it to our Oracle Fusion. Like, why are 32 people? I, I'm at the wrong Zoom meeting, right? And... I'm talking about it and they're like, well, these six people are for just this state. These four people are for these states. These eight people are specifically for New York. And I was like, why do you have 32 people for the 27 states that we're a part of? We got two of us. SAP looked at me and was like, how are you able to automate this whole process? I was like, well, we leverage technology. So AP, the sweet AP is meant to do. Scale. We talked about that earlier, right? Scale. I don't know about you, and maybe some of you do, but I don't know if you have the luxury right now of opening up a requisition for like five additional headcount that you need right now, right? You may get you you gotta you gotta fight, claw, you know, take liver body shots. You gotta do a lot of things to get that one superstar FPNA person you want, right? But if you leverage technology, the ROI is there. Sweet AP is meant to do that. Uh, Veersonic, they're like the CDW uh, over in Europe. They're really big in uh, Europe and APAC. Um, they leveraged uh, Sweet AP, managed the entire uh, uh, AP workflow. They did the right thing. $15 million in year one, reinvested right back in the business. Of the people that they had, they had a 95% retention rate of people that were in those dedicated AP roles that were repurposed in the business. These were my guys, my guys and girls. These were my tribe. I rocked with them heavy because I was like, hey, you got the savings. What are you going to do? CFO's like immediately like, we got to find, we got to find landing spots for the people. I said, cool, let's do that. He still showed his $15 million. He was happy. The board was happy. Everybody's like, CFO, you did a great job. But I even said, hey, man, talk about that. When you give that synopsis. Don't just highlight the $15 million. Talk about the 95% repurpose and retention of the employees that were in dedicated AP roles. Talk about that. He's like, why? I said, because that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. He repurposed that $15 million and had those people back in the operations in the business. These are real life use cases. These are people that are taking that initiative and saying, you know what? We can leverage AI and machine learning in our business. We can have finance lead it. We can really be focused on driving bottom line results and we can be early adopters of some of these tools and technologies. That is the value proposition. Um, this one is one of my favorite ones, right? This is the rise of the robots. I don't know about you, by show of hands, how many people have ever been in a bank in the last two years? Like you actually physically go into the bank, okay? Deposit some checks. Oh, move money between different companies, right? I used to go in the bank because I had a friend from high school that worked there, and we just talked. We just, I just go into the bank and we just talk. He's like, Chris, you always come in. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, you're getting paid, bro, but like, it's fine. Like, I'm coming in to holler. We're coming in and talk. That's the only reason why I went in the bank. But the rise of the robots, right? Goldman Sachs, Chase. You talk about an industry that is greedy and going to find a way to squeeze a, a, a nickel out of a penny and $10 out of two. It's bankers. It's investment bankers. They're going to find a way to make money and more of it. The rise of robo-advisors, these are AI and machine learning algorithms that are running funds that don't get tired, that don't party till 3 o'clock in the morning, that don't, uh, you know, have fun with recreational things, right? And they're, they're managing it. Think about why is the investment bank community so valuable and just crushing it on AI and machine learning? The four principles of it. They have 
massive years of data. Chase Goldman Sachs has decades, if not centuries, of data. The second thing is, they have massive amounts of transactions. In the last time I just talked, imagine the level of volume that transactions and results of the transactions that just happened in the last uh, 53 minutes that I just talked. Think about that, right? The third thing that they have is the available of money to invest in these tools and technologies. Okay, back when I was in college, right? If somebody came to me and says, hey, Chris, I'm going to be a data scientist. I didn't know what the hell that was. I'm like, you're going to be a data scientist. So help me understand what that actually is. Like, are you going to be in the Kelly school? Or are you going to be in like a chemistry school? Like, what is that? That's like one of the most, that's a six figure job. Easy, easy. And they got millions of dollars. And they're just scooping them up from all the big schools and like, we need data scientists. And the fourth thing is they built an incredible algorithm that is managing all of that. It's looking at all the historical performances and making recommendations of what you need to do. And it's doing it fast. It's ability to be able to do this. Low cost. That cost doesn't get transferred over to the person. No commissions being paid off of it. People signed up. I have robo-advisors. I have Chase running a lot of my money. And I'm comfortable with that. It doesn't have a name. I was like, hey, can I give my Chase robo-advisor a name? I'm going to name him, like, if I had to name him, I'd probably give him a name of, like, Valentino, because I think that's a cool-ass name. But this is the level of investment that the banks are putting into money. We're already here, and this is already blown past that. There's already over a quarter, over a half of a trillion dollars being managed by robo-advisors. There are... Massive amounts of money that is being managed, not by people, but by AI and machine learning. That's managing the money, and people are still making money. Well, the stock market's getting smoked right now. But I love this quote from Jamie Dimon. The future of AI and finance is building a bank that serves billion and provide personalization. That is one of the most important. I, I, everything that he says, like, I... You know, I disagree with him. Uh, I loved him in the, the the WeWork series. If you guys haven't watched that WeWork series on Hulu, fire. Um, but personalization, that's scale. And AI and machine learning can get you that personalization. It can get you that unique experience that's unique to you. It knows that, hey, Chris is this age. He doesn't have any kids. He's a single guy. Like, he's blah, 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 blah. This, these are the things that are going to be important to Chris. Not giving me like a $50 coupon to go to Bed Bath & Beyond or like some baby place. I'm like, bro, like, that's cool, but I'm, that's not me. When you're able to get pinpoint personalization from a technology and tool, you get that pinpoint accuracy to get that message to people, right? I don't know about you, but I'm inundated in my LinkedIn. And me and Terrell, we talked about this on a post. Like, I'm inundated with like, hey, Chris, nah, nice to meet you. Love, like, to use, like, 15 minutes of your time to talk about our SEO and, like, website development and custom development services. I have 15 minutes? Here's my, here's my calendarly link. I'm like, do you even know my business? Do you even know what I do? Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Did you not look at my LinkedIn? Like, just look at my LinkedIn. It'll, if, you, if you look at my LinkedIn and don't know what I'm doing or look at my website and don't know what I'm doing, I did a bad job. But that personalization, getting at the right moment with the right message that that person needs to hear, the same way you see personalization when you go to Facebook after you looked at Amazon and you looked at those shoes that you wanted and you're like, how's this come up in pay Facebook? How does it even know that? And then two weeks later, you get that 10% off coupon to Dick Sporting Goods that says, hey, go buy those shoes right now. You get 10% off. Or, you know, you, you get into the geolocation phase of it and you get a, a, a text message pushed to you. It's crazy how personalization is being monetized. And to me, the biggest element around that is like data is the new currency. Like it's the new currency. Businesses and people that are able to leverage data to drive actionable outcomes, that is the most sustainable but short-term competitive advantage right now. Economics of scale, all those like business school things that you're taught, is like here are the four pillars of competitive advantage. No, nobody cares about that. 
How are you able to take this data, turn it into actual outcomes, to get it to people in the shortest amount of time frame, monetize it before somebody else copies it and does it? That's pretty much the name of the game right now. And banks are doing that. They realize that. Okay, uh, so how will AI machine learning um, fit into FPNA teams, focus, CFO, talent? Um, I think the number one place that this is going to fit into is, uh, I talk about the, the, the first one, I talked about focus a lot. I've, I've, I've had story time with you guys the whole time, but I think FPNA, that partnership and advising side, is going to sit right in between the CFO, the COO. Why do I say that? Because the modern FPNA, that 2.0 level, they're going to know all the finance stuff, right? Like, I've worked with Ernst Young on the ASC 606 stuff. Like, you know, we were a private company, and we had two years before we had adopted because we got grandfathered in because they accelerated it. Public companies had to be a lot faster. Privates had more time. And I was like, nope, I want to be like the public companies, even though we're a team of three people, about a $30 million business. I was like, I want to do this because I didn't even know how to do this, right? That finance, that CFO, you're going to have that financial acumen. You're going to know your debits and credits. You're going to know your U.S. gap. You're going to know your IFRS. You're going to know. But that, that COO side, that understanding the business, that being able to speak the business language, if there's one thing that you take away from this entire session amongst all the AI scaring you and like, who is this dude? How's he a boxer? Am I going to punch him in the liver? Will he, how is he going to react? Any of those things is that the number one thing to take away right now is speaking the business's language. The, the, the myth, I don't know where this started. Maybe it started in business schools or like when, but finance, the business is not meant to serve finance. Finance is meant to serve the business. We've got to meet the business where they are. We should not expect the business to meet us where we're at. Because where are we at? We're at the end of the funnel. If you get a contract right now from sales that's all messed up, revenue recognition is wrong, no sign, doesn't total, you're at the end of the funnel. You got to go all the way back up that, that track to get that updated, right? We got to meet the business where they are. We got to understand the operations. We got to be great storytellers. We got to leverage business partnership. We got to be empathetic, data-driven, decision-making leaders. We got to be the chief filling officer. We got we to gotta like the warm and fuzzies inside of our organizations. Yeah, I'm a CFO and I'm saying that. We've got we've to connect with our people. We can't just sit over in our Excel documents, pump out our reports, give our street, give the SEC what they need. No, we got to learn the business. We got to speak the business language. We got to be great partners. We got to be great advisors inside the business. That's where that CEO, that COO element is going to be. And when you got somebody that, whether you're hiring that high potential performing person, and they've got that great financial acumen, that great understanding, but they can translate a, a 30% budget miss to what is in what that means for the business, and they understand the business, they know the operations, they know the performance, they know what drives bottom line results, that is a crazy, sick combination to have. And to me, like, that is the opportunity that we have right now is, is to change, like, and, and my closing point, and we'll get to, we'll get to questions from the room and uh, online and stuff. My closing point is, like, through everything, right, listen, there is a lot of things going on right now, socially, economically, all the leads, right? But I think one of the most important things I'm going to leave you with is how I leave every session. Every session I talked about. Last week I was doing something. I was in Miami doing all. I leave every session with this question. What is the legacy that you're going to leave for your teammates, for your family, for the community that you support, for the, for the people that are, that careers that are in your hands? For your kids, what's gonna be that legacy? What's gonna be that 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 ripple that's gonna resonate five, 10, 15 years from now? And to me, I get super passionate about rewriting. Yes. My number one thing is I wake up every day to be a CFO disruptor. I wanna disrupt exactly everybody's preconceived notions about what it means to be a CFO. 
And honestly, I, I'm passionate about it, and it's so clear to me, and I'm relentless about doing that. So that's what I want to leave you with, is know what is going to be that legacy as a controller, as a VP of finance, as a CFO, as a, a county manager, as a staff accountant, whatever role and hat that you wear, and know that right now you have the opportunity to shape that legacy. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure to follow me. Um, I'm on Fresh FPNA, all my socials, website, LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. And oh, but here's a plug. On Thursday, I got my good friend Terrell right over here. He's going to be presenting on the CFO's Guide to People and Performance Optimization. You need to add that to your schedule before you leave. I'm going to check everybody's phones and make sure you did that. That's a very, very, that's going to be a very, very uh, uh, great, great presentation. Terrell is a, a thought leader in the entire space, um, and I'm really excited for that session. So make sure you add that to your agenda. Thank you so much. I know everybody's hungry. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. One question online. Do many finance departments today use machine learning virtual models? Yeah, so the question was, do many accounting finance team use machine learning or uh, robotics? I think it depends on the industry. Um, if you're in the manufacturing industry, you're going to use a lot more robotics. Um, more RPA is what I think of it. Uh, and machine learning, I think, is like you don't have to be in um, a certain industry to leverage that. I mean, you can. There's machine learning uh, projects that you can work with in partner with sales, with marketing. Machine learning is just not just for accounting, finance, FP&A, um, and it's not just opportunities that you have. And just I know we covered a lot of those those solutions and those case studies specific to the finance organization. But there are tremendous use cases to leverage machine learning in sales, operations, marketing, client success. If you're going to pick an area to focus on, focus on those processes more upstream. So at the earliest stage when they're interacting with the customer, that way at least you have a lot of that due diligence going down to where it gets to finance. Is that it? Any questions? Hey, guys, enjoy lunch. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.